Welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcaster. I'm your host, Manpreet, a.k.a. MMA Lock of the Night, and your boy on Twitter, at MMALOTN. Today, we're going to be breaking down UFC Philadelphia, headlined by Edson Barboza and Justin Gaethje, which should be a fucking barn burner, like, fight of the night all over it, or fight of the year. Like, that's the type of aspirations we're getting. Hopefully, we don't get honey dick like fucking Derek Lewis and Francis Ngannou, but... That's a different story. I don't even want to fucking... I'm, I'm, I'm already about to start to cry as soon as I mention that fight. Regardless, we're going to be kin- kicking this week's episode off with the casuals. And my man Big Rob is here as always. Yeah. What's what up, up, what up, what up, what up. Uh, so today, we're just going to get right the fuck into it. Uh, it doesn't really have any relevance to any of the fights that have happened recently. This guy did fight recently. But uh, again, I wanted to show this to my boy Big Rob from time ago. Uh, so... I just thought, why the fuck not? Let's just do it this week. So I'm going to be showing him, showing him Nico Price versus Randy Brown. Probably one of the KOs of the year last year. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't even want to say much about it. So we're going to be kicking it off with 408 left in the second round. And we all know what the fuck happens after that. Uh, okay, that so down. Nico Price is the guy that's on the ground. Okay, with his, yeah, hits. And Randy Brown is oh. doing very well right now. Oh. <laughs> sure is. Oh, no, no. <laughs> wow. He completely deaded him. So. He totally hit his off switch. That looks barbaric and like savage as fuck, right? But really take into consideration the fact that he's punching against gravity. Yeah. Off of his back and just nailing this guy n- numerous times just in the same spot. It's kind of the temple, too. It wasn't really even the chin. Like, no. Just was- repeatedly. And. Imagine how heavy those hands need to be to put. I've never seen it. I've seen people attempt shit like this, but I think it was just correct positioning, uh, correct timing. Obviously, the massive amounts of power this guy's able to, to hold in his hands. But once you see the replay, he does something very. It's a very unorthodox technique. You'll, okay. you'll see it coming up we'll right see. now. So, here it goes. Move of the fight brought to you by Metro PCS. Okay. So, watch yep. his. Watch his left. No, watch what what leg is oh. it? That leg. Boom. You see how it's kind of bracing him by his neck, and then he's using his hand to punch him. I'll show it to you. It should come back one more time. But his foot is bracing his neck. Oh, it's holding its head. It's out. holding it in the he in can't, place. He, he can't move his head out of the way. No. And he's just fucking kind of using the f- momentum of kind of his feet pulling back towards him and his hand pulling yeah against he's getting him, right? hit on both ends how fucking nuts is that look at oh, that I see shit. It now wow right because if his foot wasn't there the guy would probably be, be able, yeah, yeah he'd have he, room for it to kind of like yeah, move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but he has no room to move if his head it's not head it's is... being absorbed exactly right how fucking nuts is that i've never seen a ko like that where the guy's on his back and fucking nuts <laughs> How fucking if, crazy is that? If he did that for like 10 more seconds, his like brain dead, would be coming dead. out of his nose. <laughs> <laughs> like pudding. <laughs> yeah. That would be bad. Like, we don't need any of that no, type of no, shit. No, no, We're trying wow. to make the sport as mainstream as possible. We don't need it to be that no. barbaric. That, that, yeah, wow. That was, no. just, that was fucking brutal, st- eh? Yeah, it was smart. No, it, it's... Lost strategy there. Exactly. Like, it, it may seem very unorthodox, but he found himself in that position and he fucking took advantage of it, right? Is there is there just hopping off the casuals a little bit, but just getting a quick answer from a man here? Is there any casuals clip that I've shown you that kind of you can remember off the top of your head, like one that really stands out to you, or do they, are they all kind of just blending in? Because I've been showing you like really good <sighs> shit, so I can completely understand if they all blend together. Whereas, like, you know what, the, yeah. you know, the, for me the. The ones that kind of stand out are the ones that have the twist endings, you know. And okay, and yeah, it looks like it's going one yeah, way, and if, yeah. like perfect example, the one that we yeah. just saw, right? Mm-hmm. Randy Brown was like beating him up, yeah. and then I don't know where Nico Price pulls it off, right? It's impressive, yeah, yeah. I believe I like that a lot. I like I like the twist. Yeah, I really do. Like the roller coaster almost, right? Right, right. The, I believe I showed him the the Czech Congo and Pat Berry one, which is one of the first ones I ever showed him, but. That one was nuts where the guy dropped numerous times and got back up and then eventually KO'd the other guy. So, like, it's cool seeing those shifts in momentum, mm-hmm. right? For a casual fan, it's got to be fucking like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. 90% of the sport is technical, guys mm-hmm. going for grappling, and obviously that's not the best eye candy for, like, a casual fan. Sure. But when I show you, like, you know, momentum swings like that and crazy slobber knockers and shit, like, 
obviously that's what brings you guys in the casuals who are who we need to help grow this fucking sport <laughs> so maybe eventually we'll watch a ufc together down the road but <laughs> right. yeah. i'm gonna get him to say yo john jones is fighting this weekend what are you saying <laughs> i don't know who that is yeah but one, one day, day you'll know one day you'll know <laughs> All right, so that that's pretty much uh, the bow that we're putting on uh, the casuals for this week. Um, yeah, fucking insane knockout from Nico Price. So let's just fucking get into. Oh, we got to get into it. Um, the the horrible weekend that I had. <laughs> uh, you know, one of those nights is always bound to happen, but it's always the shittiest when it fucking happens. I tweeted out, I feel like I want to throw up because that's exactly how I fucking felt that night. Um, so just kicking things off, we'll just start off with my luck of the night play. Uh, Angela Hill versus Rana Marcos. Whew. I knew I was going to take some heat for that pick, uh, but I felt very fucking confident. You know, I mean, if you don't have confidence in the game, you're, you're always going to succumb to other, you know peer pressure from other people. Uh, you got to stay strong with your analysis and what you believe you're going to see in that fight. Um, you know, uh, with the, the information that I, I had rec- acquired through my research, I had thought that Angela Hill would perform a lot better than she did. You know, the fact that she was willingly engaging in the clinch was kind of a. It was a first red flag, essentially. You know what I mean? She showed great foot movement as she always does. Um, you know, she started off with a couple of good strikes, um, and I thought, you know, she was doing well until she fucking got clinched, or uh, continued to initiate the clinch, and then eventually got taken down. But by a, by a. A takedown I thought she would not get taken down by. Ronald Marcos is a relatively strong chick, but those head and arm throws are just fucking garbage and like probably one of the first things that you should learn as a defense if you're going to be wrestling or clinching or anything of that sort. With that said, you know, Ronald Marcos was just able to stay heavy on top and Angela Hill just had nothing to fucking to, to throw back at her. And it, it was very demoralizing. Uh, I, I Again, it the, the first pound in my heart that really hurt was when she initiated the clinch i'm like no this is not what you should be fucking doing i know you worked on your bjj but use that as a second or your last resort type of thing if you get taken down then lean on it fuck it you know you have the perfect game plan movement style and striking ability to completely outwork ronda marcos on the feet but it didn't happen so minus five units on that uh my first dog of the night play was justin willis uh, plus 252 at one unit, uh, minus one unit. You know, I, I felt comfortable taking that shot, even though the 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 unknown of Justin Willis's takedown defense. You know, we we all know his his background in terms of working with guys at AKA, AKA. So a lot of people kind of just say, you know, by association, he should have good takedown defense. I didn't want to lead on that. Uh, argument too much uh but i did think it was a slight positive you know it's 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 a it's a positive to be able to train with guys like kane and and dc and those guys so he may not have them in his corner and may not be permanent training partners but to have experience against high level mma wrestlers like that it's got to mean something right uh and then obviously we haven't really seen much deficiencies for his from his game on the feet you know uh chris boxer good jab good foot foot movement for a guy with his physique um so I thought he was going to be able to kind of just work his his game uh, on the feet uh, and kind of keep Curtis Blades from from kind of shooting and having good enough takedown defense to be able to shuck off a, a takedown or two. But once Curtis Blades was able to get that first one, the rest just came relatively easy to him. So, you know, minus one unit on Justin Willis there. And then last we had Frankie Sines, 1.5 units at plus one, 143, I believe it was. Uh, you know, pfft. Frankie Sines, I've seen him take much harder shots before and walk through them. So for uh, Marlon Vera to be able to get that shot, that, that perfectly timed jab uh, to, to land and to drop Frankie Sines, you know, good on him. Uh, I've, I've said to people in the past, I'm not a big Marlon Vera believer. I thought that Frankie Sines was going to be able to grind this one out, you know, at bare minimum, take two rounds away from uh, Marlon Vera and then be able to, you know, withstand any heat in that third round to, to you know, close out that decision victory. However... Marlon Vera fucking just has the power of Thor for some reason in his left hand and knocks uh, Frankie Sines down with a jab and then eventually follows up with punches and finishes him off. Minus 1.5 units on that. So utter, complete dog shit of a night. UFC Nashville was for me one that I want to quickly forget. And thankfully we have an event this weekend that we can fucking forget it with. Hopefully. 
UFC Philadelphia, Edson Barboza versus Justin Gaethje. Amazing fucking fight, like I said, right off the top. Um, right off the bat, it's, you know, contender for fight of the year. And we haven't even had these men step in the cage yet. So, knock on wood, hopefully I'm not fucking that up. And they, you know, don't fucking stare at each other for five rounds. And Justin Gaethje, for some reason, wants to, you know, resort to his wrestling game, which I believe he should, uh, and just make this a boring fight and just lay and pray. I, I don't see that happening, but we've seen crazier shit happen in the octagon. Regardless, uh, this, in my opinion, is a top-heavy card with the main event being such a slobber knocker and banger that people are kind of just like, eh, the, the rest of the card is whatever. Don't really need to worry about it. Um, but, you know, with names like, up-and-coming names like Sodiq Yusuf, Kennedy, and Zichiku, I almost butchered that one, uh, Enrique Barzola, Kevin Holland, Ray Borg's return, uh, you know, for the hardcores, this is a great fucking card. You know, Josh Emmett against uh, Michael Johnson, David Branch against Jack Hermanson, who is on the cusp of, uh, you know, UFC ranking, <laughs> I believe. Uh, and then you got Michelle Watterson thrown in there with Carolina Kovacavich. So overall, I think it's a great fucking card as a hardcore. Uh, but obviously, everybody's here for fucking Edson Barbos and Justin Gaethje, and I can't fucking blame them. Straight up. <laughs> so let's just fucking get this going. I got a I got a potty mouth today. Y'all got to deal with it. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> First up, we got Alex Perez versus Mark De La Rosa. So Alex Perez is coming off a or sorry a finish from uh, Joseph Benavides back in November. Uh, so he took about four exactly four months off and came back and now he's fighting Mark De La Rosa. So uh, up until that Joseph Benavides fight, you know he looked great. Uh, absolutely demolished Jose Torres, who just seemed to have you know. His, his noggin is just probably one of the funniest targets in MMA. I feel bad for the guy. You know what I mean? His 80% of his weight is in his head. But, uh, you know, it was funny seeing Alex Perez kind of just tee off on him and kind of have fun in that fight. Um, I'm, I I like Alex Perez's striking. You know, I, I didn't think that his striking against Joseph Benavides looked entirely bad. But uh, I think he's going to have a better performance here against Mark De La Rosa, uh, you know. Only had one loss in his career. That's Mark De La Rosa. Uh, he's coming off a split decision victory over Joby Sanchez. Uh, and then before that, he was able to choke out Elias Garcia. His only loss came to Tim Elliott um, back in December of 2017. So he's more of a grappler. You know what I mean? I think his, his entire game is trying to get this into grappling exchanges, clinch exchanges, and try to... Um, you know, pull out some sort of uh, submission victory. I think he's going to have a hard time against uh, Alex Perez uh, in terms of trying to pull that off. I think that Alex Perez is going to have the advantage on the, on the feet. I think he's going to be able to box uh, Mark De La Rosa up. He's going to have the advantage, too, in terms of size as well, uh, which I believe translates in terms to the reach. Uh, 65 inches for Mark De La Rosa, 65 and a half for Alex Perez. But he does stand, you know, a solid... Ugh, man, I feel like some of these fucking... like. I'm going to have to see these guys when they face off, but I feel like uh, some of these metrics on topology are off. So they have Alex Perez at 5'7", and Mark De La Rosa at 5'6". I feel like it's going to be a little bit bigger than that, but I guess the numbers don't lie. Who the fuck knows? Uh, but regardless, I think that Alex Perez is going to win this fight on the feet. I think he is going to be able to finish Mark De La Rosa as well, probably in the second or third round. Um, you know, we, may, we might see Mark De La Rosa successfully get one takedown, but I trust... And uh, Alex Perez's uh, submission defense uh, to at least, you know, gut out that first round. May lose that first round. But I think that once he puts his hands together and kind of keeps Mark De La Rosa on the outside, he should be able to win this fight um, strictly on the feet. So I'm going to take uh, Alex Perez by second round. K-O, T-K-O, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Next up, we got a highly anticipated debut, apparently, uh, of Sabina Mazzo who is currently 5-0. and She's coming over from the LFA. Uh, and she's taking on Marina Moroz, who has been a very interesting uh, fighter in this division. So last time we saw Marina Moroz, she lost a decision to Angela Hill. She threw a fuck ton of strikes that fight. Uh, how many landed? I don't fucking know. <laughs> it was not much. Uh, you know, a lot of like a lot of people like to call her the last airbender. Uh, you know, we got the last style bender with Israel Adesanya, who's very efficient and styles on motherfuckers. Whereas Marina Moroz is just fucking bending air with these punches that are hitting nothing at all. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how Sabina Manzo is going to be able to um, adjust 
to the bright lights and big big cameras, whatever the fuck you want to call it, uh, with Sabina Mazzo, uh, you know, only five and zero, oh, still very fucking young, um, and I think she still has a lot of work to do. I don't know if Marina Morosa is going to be the one to actually give her problems. Uh, you know, again, just her style is just so weird. You know, I don't know if she's going to be able to actually get Sabina Mazzo down. Uh, I think she'll just based on. Uh, you know, resume alone, I gotta kind of assume that Marina Moroz has the the better jujitsu here. Um, I haven't looked into this fight too much just because the the line doesn't really intrigue me at the moment. I might look into it a little bit later this week, but uh, I, I I've said it recently. You know, what I mean, you gotta take UFC debuts with a grain of salt almost. So I bet on two UFC debuts this year, and both of them have lost for me. Especially like they have everything in their favor, and they still find a way to lose. Um, so. <laughs> In this fight, you know, you got Sabina Mazzo currently sitting around minus 165. Um, you know, that means that people are kind of confident or, you know, the the, the line is kind of closing. So there's definitely some Marina Moreau's coming, Marina Moreau's money coming in. But I don't know about Sabina. I, I got to look, you know, she she's definitely a striker. You know, she throws some good kicks. I don't know so much about her hands. Uh, I don't know how much about her power. Like she has great, you know, obviously she has great power in her legs. You know, she was able to knock a motherfucker out. <laughs> but with Marina Moroz, um, you know, is she going to come with the clinch heavy game style? Is she going to come with the, 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 the persistency to want to get the fight to the ground? Or is she just going to want to comp, you know, think that she can out volume Sabina Mazzo and kind of just land more strikes or throw more strikes and kind of look like the more active one? So I don't, I really don't know which way to go with this fight. Personally, I'm going to stay away, stay away from it currently. Um, I got, I got to look into it a little bit more, but I'm going to side with, um, I'm going to side with Sabina Mazzo. You know, I think she does end up landing more. She kind of busts up Marina Moroz on the feet uh, and, you know, has a decent debut, uh, but I would not trust her at the current price yet. She's at considering what I've seen so far. Unless the fight gets closer to like minus 125, minus 130, I wouldn't consider betting Sabina Mazzo. Next up, we got Ray Borg, the return. I had to fucking rock his shirt today. I just had to, out of respect. If you go to this guy's topology fucking page, you're going to see how woeful his last, since the, Demi so his last fight was Demetrius Johnson <laughs> when he got fucking suplex, mighty mouse trap, whatever the fuck they called it, and armbarred. Um, so he hasn't fought since October 2017. That's nuts. That was, two, that was a year and a half ago. So he was scheduled to fight Brandon Moreno in uh, February of 2018. Pulled out. Uh, you know what? I'm not even going to go into what happened to these things because there's a lot of different things that happened. But Moreno, February 2018, pulled out. Moreno, April 2018, pulled out. Moreno, May 18th, pulled out. Joseph Benavides, November 10th, uh, 2018, pulled out. Uh, Ping Yuang Liu, I can't, I keep butchering the guy's name. They were scheduled to fight uh, April 30th. Oh, actually, he's had three different opponents for this fight already. So, so we got Ping Yuan Lian. He was supposed to fight. I fucking butchered that so bad. Uh, Kyler Phillips, and then last minute, within the last day or so, uh, Casey Kenny comes in to fight Ray Borg now. So, starting right off the bat with Ray Borg. You know, he looked like a fucking world beater uh, all the way up to his fight against um, Demetrius Johnson. You know, he lost a decision to Justin Scargans back in the day in 2016. Uh, and then his UFC debut, he also lost a, a split decision to J Dustin Ortiz. But he's always been a guy that had, looks like he has a ton of fucking potential. Um, you know, his last win, Juicy A. Formiga, who is right up there for fucking number one contender shot, which is, uh, yeah, I think... People are saying that Formiga is going to be fighting Benavides for number one title shot. So, you know, Ray Borg is definitely still up there. You know, that Louis Smoka fight, a little fishy. Like, I, again, I'm not completely sold on Louis Smoka. Um, but uh, Juicy Formiga, you know, that's a big win. Uh, a guy with such a grapple-heavy game to beat a guy like Juicy Formiga, it shows that he has enough hands to at least, keep, you know, if the fight were to stay on the feet, he would still be successful. Um, I So I've looked into Casey Kenny a little bit. I had... Not much time at all, just due to the fact that it was just such a late announcement. Um, but I saw his fight on the the, the contender series. And he, you know, seems like he throws heavy, uh, heavy on his feet. 
Um, I did not get a chance to mu see much of his grappling acumen, so I definitely have to look into that a little bit. Um, you know, his last, I know he just fought, fought this past weekend on LFA and became a two division world champion, even though one of those was an interim title. I don't even want, know why the fuck regional fights are doing this shit now. So don't give me a regional double interim champ or some shit like that. Fuck that, man. Like, I, ugh, fuck it. I don't even want to get into that. So yeah, Casey Kenny coming over as a dual champ, asterisk, uh, to fight Ray Borg. Stiff test in his first fight. You know what I mean? Ray Borg has been shown to be top five in the division, top three in, in the division, if you want to call it that. Um, but I think this is a good fight for, well, considering the fact that he was supposed to fight three, two other guys, this is a good fight for him to come back to and kind of just get his feet wet again, get, you know, get the groove on, uh, dust off the rust. Uh, I think that, um, you know, he should, he's had a very strong grappling game, and it's going to be. It's hard for me to think that a guy like Casey Kenny coming in on such short notice uh, is going to be able to drill that enough to be able to have a good enough takedown defense and game to 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 you know to beat a guy like Reborg. You can say he's still fight ready since he just fought last week, but you know, has he stayed ready since that fight? Like, did he fucking binge out and like gain a bunch of weight in that two or three days where he wasn't getting the fight? Or, you know, did he already know that with a win here, you know, there is rumblings that fucking uh, Kyler Phillips is going to pull out. So let me just stay fight ready. We don't know that. I don't know that, honestly. So I, I'd say Borg is a safe pick here, but uh, definitely not worth it at like the minus 400 range that I last saw him at. So I'm not picking Ray Borg at chalk. I was considering parlaying him, but uh, I, with everything that's just been going on with him, I'm I'm kind of skeptical to even consider playing Ray Borg. Um, there are no odds for Ray Borg, obviously, so they probably took him down. Um, but yeah, pass on this fight. Unless you feel like you have a really good read on Casey Kenny and you believe you can get some good dog money on him, by all means, go for it. Uh, but I, I wouldn't take anything that I said to heart <laughs> regarding this uh, matchup. But I'm going to take Ray Borg. You know, looks good enough in his comeback fight uh, to pull off the victory here against Casey Kenny. I'm going to say decision. Next up, we got the trailblazer, Mr. Kevin Holland against Gerald Mearshart. So Kevin Holland is coming in off of a victory over John Phillips that is following a uh, decision loss that he had to Tiago Santos back in August of 2018. I believe he took that fight on short notice, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe not. Uh, but regardless, Kevin Holland fucking you know, grew his fan base tenfold after that Tiago Santos fight, even though he took an L. You know, a lot of people liked his antics in the cage. He's a, you know, he's a wild talker, does some wild shit, um, you know, talks throughout the whole fucking fight. He has a likable attitude about him, I'll give him that. Uh, but I've heard a lot of shit in terms of, you know, he doesn't probably train the hardest. He could probably be at either a better camp, uh, guys that could get him more ready, and he could just be more focused and have a better work ethic. How true that is, I'm not sure. How much has a win in the UFC sparked his... You know, it sparked his uh, his 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 motivation uh, to train better, to be better. You know, he's fighting at 185. Is this fight? Uh, this fight's on 185 as well. Uh, he's fighting at 185. When a lot of people think that he could probably even go down to 170. You know, he's not the. He has a tall frame and a tall, lanky frame, but he's not like shredded or ripped or anything like that. A lot of people have said at 6'3", he could probably make 170, and it would be interesting to see if he did do that. So maybe a loss here to Gerald Mearsham might. You know, kind of push him in that direction, kind of thinking that his job is on the line. Uh, but it would be hard to see that, considering he's only be he would only be coming off of one loss. Gerald Mearshart, on the other hand, is coming off a loss to the guy who's in the Coleman event, Jack Hermanson. Uh, got completely dummied in that fight. There's no other way about it. You know, Jack Hermanson came out with this crazy style uh, on the feet, and eventually got the fight to the ground, and then eventually uh, got. Uh, Gerald Mearshart in a guillotine choke but before that you know he had a victory over Oscar Piachoto in a fight I believe he came in as a pretty hefty underdog plus 180 underdog uh, and then before that he beat Eric Spicy before also losing to Tiago Santos so both of these guys have suffered a loss to Tiago Santos I believe that Kevin Holland is going to have the advantage here he is just so fucking skilled but it's just uh, it's about applying it correctly for him um, I think that you know Mearshart is a good all around fighter He's been around the game. He's at fucking, what is that, 39, 40? This is going to be his 40th fight. Kevin Holland, you know, 14 to 4 right now, uh, 18 fights into his career. I think he still has some room to grow. Um, 
And I think Gerald Mearshart is kind of the perfect opponent for him to kind of style on to a certain extent, but also be able to get a, a solid victory, which should help his confidence and moving forward into you know this middleweight division. But again, I hope he goes down to 170. I think that might be the best place for him. Um, but I yeah, I'm going to pick Kevin Holland here. I think we see a finish, maybe third round TKO. Uh, <clears throat> I think he has the striking ability to you know hurt Gerald on the outside, keep Gerald on the outside, and I think he has wacky enough uh, submission or like jujitsu to kind of like create scrambles and get out of bad position. So I'm going to take Kevin Holland here by third round TKO, uh, and it should be actually a fun fight too. I think that Gerald Mirashar is definitely going to give his best too, but I just don't think it's going to be enough to beat a guy like Kevin Holland. Next up, we got Enrique Barzola against Kevin Aguilar. So Enrique Barzola training out of American Top Team, which is a huge plus for him in this aspect. Um, coming off of four straight victories, Chris Avila, G Gabriel Benitez, Matt Bissett, and Brandon Davis. Not the top flag of competition, but he has looked great in those fights. They have all been unanimous uh, decision victories for himself. <clears throat> and uh, he's coming into this fight with Kevin Aguilar, you know, as a, a very complete fighter, you know, uh, a lot of people wanted to give him uh, applause and, and, you know, take off their hats to his stand-up striking, uh, his his abilities there. I think he's a vicious striker. I think that his leg kicks are great. Uh, he started implementing in that low calf kick against uh, Brandon Davis, and I think that's going to come into a heavy play here against Kevin Aguilar. You know, Kevin Aguilar, I said to one of my friends earlier today, I think he is like the ultimate mediocre fighter. You know, he's he's good. I know he's 16 and 1. I'm going to call him mediocre regardless. He's fought, you know, he's fought good competition. I'll give that to him. But also, you know, I lost to Leonard Garcia back in the day. Obviously, that was six years ago. I'm not trying to say take anything away from him. <clears throat> but he had a sloppy ish performance against Joey Gomez in his Dana White Contender Series fight. And then he had, a, you know, an interesting fight against Rick Glenn. He's a very good counter striker. Not very good. He's a good counter striker uh but he plods very heavily and he really accepts he he allows himself to accept the back foot a lot i saw that a lot in the joy gomez and rick Lenn fight um and i think that's where enrique barzola is going to shine so rick Lenn went over four on takedowns against uh against uh kevin aguilar but i think that enrique barzola is definitely going to be a lot more um successful in the takedown department in this fight i think he has the uh the striking ability to kind of lull uh, Kevin Aguilar into thinking that this is a striking fight, and then bam, goes for the takedown. Obviously, Kevin Aguilar is going to be ready for the takedown as he knows that that's, you know, in Enrique Barzola's back pocket. But is he going to be able to stuff the second and third uh, shots after Barzola has started to beat up that lead leg? I really see that Kevin Aguilar has a... I don't know if it's a problem because maybe it might work out for him because he's able to pack such power into his uh, counter striking but the fact that he you know stands so heavy on that lead foot i think that that's kind of just the perfect target for enrique brazola and his calf kicks i think we're going to see a lot of fighters implementing that you know we saw that in the mark T.A. casey fight against uh, joe duffy a couple weeks ago i think we're going to see something similar here with enrique brazola where he's going to kind of pick up or pick apart kevin aguilar on the outside and then he's just become so strong and and vicious with these takedowns as of late. I think he's going to work for the takedowns a lot harder than Rick Glenn was uh, and be successful after, you know, having his, his success on the feed. So the the one uh, question that I have here, though, is Enrique, is Enrique Berzola going to be able to handle the striking that's going to be coming back to uh, coming back at him from Kevin Nagler? I think it is. I think he has good distance management. I think that he will be the one moving forward. And I think that, again, with Kevin Aguilar accepting the back foot as much as he does, it's going to be tough for him. So I'm taking Enrique Barzola here. I think uh, I'm going to take him by decision. I don't know if he's going to be able to finish Kevin Aguilar. I know Aguilar is very tough. He's been to a lot of decisions. Um, you know, just a tough guy. He's taken a lot of damage over the years. But I think that uh, Enrique Barzola has this fight. Um, and he's going to win by decision. Plain and simple. I'm considering betting on him. And the odds continue to get better. He's fucking... Last time I checked, he was minus 107. He is now minus 103 at Bet Online, which I don't have access to. Uh, t -t 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 minus 106 on Pinnacle. You know, I might play Barzola, and I might play him heavy, too. And I think this is his fucking fight. So, yeah, Barzola by decision. 
Next up, we got Ross, the real motherfucking deal, Pearson against Desmond Green. Uh, yeah, Ross Pearson is still doing the damn thing. The guy is 20 and 15, 35 fights. I think all, <laughs> almost all of them are in the UFC. Let's see here. He... So he had 10 fights or 11 fights before coming to the UFC. And now he is uh, 20 and 15. <laughs> so in the UFC alone, he has gone... What is that? 8 and 3. He started 8 and 3 and now he's 20 and 15. So he's gone 12 and... 13 in his UFC run. So he's had a very up and down career since uh, his loss to Will Brooks in 20, July 2016. He's had uh, four back to back to back to back losses. Then he beat Mizuto Hirota and then he lost to John McDessie his last time out in July of this past year. Uh, he's scheduled to fight Joe Duffy back in December, pulled out. Uh, and now here he is finding himself going against a very different fighter uh, and somebody that could pose a lot of problem to him. Uh, is Desmond Green. So Desmond Green is a journeyman of his own. You know, he's 21 and 8, uh, had a kind of an up and down UFC career as well, but he's gone up against some very tough fucking names. Uh, Hustam Habilov, Michel Prezeres, and then in his last fight around, he had um, uh, a missed weight Mirabek Tysonov as well. So very tough outs for him. I think this is a very favorable fight for him, however, against Ross Pearson, who's starting to show his age. You know, he's starting to slow down a little bit. He's very rudimentary with his, his game, you know, just wants to strike he doesn't matter how many fucking punches he eats he just want to keep moving forward and striking uh but i just think his speed you know his timing is kind of off he's just slow man there's a reason desmond green is a close to a minus 400 favorite here with that said i wouldn't feel comfortable putting desmond green into a minus 400 um a minus 400 fight uh, or sorry minus 400 odds um you know ross pearson ha you know he has that rudimentary style that one-dimensional style of just striking but that could easily you know in a close fight that could easily sway the judges they could probably be like hey he's fucking throwing more strikes this round uh he was on the he was moving forward more excuse me he was moving forward more uh you know and maybe he may just be throwing that air but the fact that he's throwing more volume might be the the issue here I think Desmond Green's key to victory here is initiating the clinch and getting this fight to the ground as much as he can. Uh, I think he has decent enough striking to kind of hold his own against Ross Pearson, but I think for him to win this fight, he's going to have to make more monumental movements uh, or make more monumental moments than just Ross Pearson moving forward and striking. I think he has the chops to get Ross Pearson down, and I think he has the chops to actually keep Ross Pearson down. He has good does he has a good resting base, uh, and his striking is improving with Henry Hooft as well. So I think he has uh, he has all the all the makings to win this fight. But at minus four hundred, I just don't trust him, and it could be a lot closer of a fight uh, than it should be. Just my just my opinion. <laughs> So I'm, I am going to take Desmond Green by decision. I think he does land the takedowns and get, you know, maintains position and, and wins each round. Uh, but who the fuck knows? Ross Pearson might just show up with some crazy, ridiculous takedown defense and Desmond Green's never, you know, able to get this to the ground and Ross Pearson just outvolumes him on the feet and wins a decision. But you guys are here for my prediction. I predict a Desmond Green decision victory. <laughs> All right, next fight. Alexa Grasso versus, oh no, wait, this is my mistake. <laughs> so I did take this off of UFC.com uh, so you guys can fucking blame them. But let's just imagine that we got uh, right here. Oh, nope, not that one. Right here is uh, Jessica Aguilar's face. <laughs> okay, so we got Jessica Aguilar against Marina Rodriguez. Jessica Aguilar is coming in on very, very short notice. Um... Let's see how short notice it was. Uh, it was within the last week. So very, very short notice for Jessica Aguilar. Uh, with Marina Rodriguez, she's coming off a, a fight that went to a majority draw um, against Ronda Marcos back in September of, of uh, 2018. So, you know, that fight was a lot of, like, uh, grappling for Ronda Marcos and then a lot of uh, Marina Rodriguez uh, picking apart Ronda Marcos on the feet for the next two rounds. Um I think that Aguilar has the chin and capabilities of kind of eating these shots from Marina Rodriguez and kind of closing the distance and making it a dirty fight. Uh, I see the odds are, like, f f in my opinion, I think they're a little bit wide. Uh, 
minus 300-ish for Marino Rodriguez, you know, plus 230-ish for Jesse Aguilar, you know, I might look into this fight a little bit more just because a fight like this should not be lined that wide. You know, Jessica Aguilar, is, you know, she was able to take the, the, the stand-up striking of Jody Escobar, who I'm not, I'm not saying she has, you know, knockout power or anything like that, but she has clean, crisp technique. And if uh, Jessica Aguilar was able to squeak out a win over her, maybe she would be able to squeak out a win over Marina Rodriguez. Obviously, the difference here between Rodriguez and um, fucking Jordi Escobel is that Marina Rodriguez pack, packs a little bit more of a punch. I just don't think that she's going to be able to drop Jessica Aguilar and finish her. Um, and at these odds, I would consider Jessica Aguilar. I can't believe I'm fucking saying that in 2019, but the odds should not be that wide. If they start to close and we get a little bit better of a line on Marina Rodriguez, like I'm talking minus 200-ish, I would consider a bet on Marina Rodriguez, minus 175-ish even. But currently at these odds, I think the, it favors Jessica Aguilar. <clears throat> so don't be surprised if you guys see a Jessica Aguilar play for me. But with that said, my pick and prediction is actually going to be Marina Rodriguez. I think that she does pick apart Jessica Aguilar on the feet. Uh, stays away enough to, you know, keep away from Jessica Aguilar's clinch ability. Um, you know, Jessica Aguilar is slower. You know, she is slower. She is the older woman. Um, but something just always tells me that. You know what I mean? Again, Alexio Linick, Mark Hunt. You know, anything is fucking possible. So all Jessica Aguilar needs to do is squeak out two, two rounds and then just absorb strikes for the third. But I'm going to take Marina Rodriguez by a 29-28 decision. I think she just picks up. She might, you know, succumb to a, a takedown in the first round. But I think in the second and third round, just like the Ronda Marcos fight, she kind of pulls away with it with the striking and wins a decision victory. So, Marina Rodriguez by decision. Possible bet on Jessica Aguilar if the fights, or if the odds stay like minus 230-ish. <clears throat> Next up. We got a, a possible fight of the night contender here. You know, we got a lot of fight of the night contenders here, especially the main event. Uh, but we got Shaman Marais against Sodiq Yusuf. So Shaman Marais, the first time I heard about this guy was when he fought uh, Marlon Marais uh, for the WSOF title. Um, I just found it funny. Marais versus Marais. Hilarious, right? Fucking maybe cousins fighting each other or some shit. But obviously we all know that Marais or Marais, Marais, uh, is a very common Brazilian last name. So uh, that's the first time I heard about him. He put up a decent performance, but then eventually succumbed to a third-round rear naked choke by Marlon Marais. Uh, then he went on to beat Robbie Peralta and Luis Palomino before making his UFC debut against Zabit Magomed Sherpov. Talk about, talk about a welcoming party, eh? So uh, next up, he fought Matt Sales and then eventually beat Julio Arce by split decision in his last fight. That was a fight where I bet Julio Arce in the third round because I've always seen a little bit of a deficiency in Shaman Marais' third round output. Um, he seemed to tighten that up a little bit. You know, he beat up Julio Arce really bad in those first two rounds, completely outstruck him, completely made him look like shit. Um, and then Julio Arce just didn't have enough in the tank to kind of get that finish over Shaman Marais, who so did still show a little bit of, you know, cardio issues but not to the point where i'm concerned and would bet against him in the third round uh once again he's coming up against a guy and sadiq yusuf who is kind of you know uh making a little bit of a name for himself he came in and and, and completely dusted suman makarian in his last fight uh and he's coming into this fight you know riding a you know a very interesting uh rise I should say, you know, he's a Lloyd Irvin guy, so there's that little backdrop to this fight. Uh, but he's very exciting, man. He's been deading guys. Uh, he had a Dana White contender series fight where it went to a decision, but you know, he looked good in that fight, and then just completely ragged on, destroyed Sulman Maktarian. But this fight against Shaman Rice is going to be a fucking battle, man. I, it's it's going to be interesting to see Sadiq Yusuf striking against um, against Shaman Rice's, you know, Muay Thai brutal Muay Thai. Um, is Sadiq Yusuf going to show? Um, you know, better durability than Julio Arce and pull away with this fight later in the round or later in the fight, or is Shaman Rice going to have fun with him from, from, from bell to bell? Uh, currently, the f odds sit around minus 150 is Sodiq Yusuf, uh, plus 130 is for Shaman Rice. I think it should be landed a little bit closer, to be honest. Um, so if you're going to bet this fight, I would take the underdog money on Shaman Rice. But currently, you know, I love Yusuf. I hope he wins this fight, but I'm going to actually lean with and take Shaman Marais here. Um, I might look at it as a possible bet. Like I'm going to look into it a little bit deeper, but uh, I'm very impressed with both of their strikings. I'd say that Sadiq Yusuf has a little bit more power, but Shaman Marais has more technique and 
and just you know the better striking i would say uh but yeah very very interesting fight i think it's up there for fight of the night for sure uh, I'm going to go with Shaman Rice by decision. I think he picks apart Sadiq Yusuf. This fight is relatively going to stay on the feet, and that's where I think that Shaman Rice has uh, the more the more weapons. Uh, so yeah, Shaman Rice by decision. Next up, we got a UFC debut in, in Kennedy and Zechiku. I think I nailed that. <laughs> Against the Bear Jew, uh, Paul Craig. Starting off with Paul Craig, he's coming off a loss to Jimmy Crute back in December. Um... But uh, before that, you know, he pulled off that miraculous comeback against Magomed Ankalaev with one second left. Pulled off a triangle choke, which crushed many a heart <laughs> for Magomed Ankalaev backers. Uh, but before, before that, lost to Khalil Roundtree and Tyson Pedro. So he's had a little bit of a tumultuous uh, UFC run. Uh, so he cur currently sits at 2-3 and three in the UFC. And now he has a very stiff test against him once again in Kennedy and Zichiku. Uh I heard about Kennedy and Zichuku the first time uh, when he fought in the Dana White Contender Series against Anton Berzin. He came in as a 2-0 fighter. So there was a lot of hype around this guy, even though he was only 2-0. He ended up only pulling off a split decision against Anton Berzin, and it was a fight where uh, cardio really became an issue for both of these guys. But Kennedy and Zichuku just had that little extra oomph to steal this fight from Berzin. Uh, and then he had followed that up with three more victories, uh, one in the XKO, one in the LFA, and then another appearance on the Dana White Contender Series where he completely deaded this guy with a head kick and punches was nuts. Uh, so the obvious um, the obvious caveat here with Kennedy and Zichuku is his lack of experience. He is 6-0. and oh. oh, maybe there's some shit going down. <laughs> uh, you know, He's 6'5", 83 inches, 26 years old, so still very young in the game, and sitting at 6-0. and uh, He has all finishes except two fights, including that Dana White Contender Series fight from the first season. Uh, and now he's going up against a guy in Paul Craig who really likes his jiu-jitsu game. So I think if we are going to see any type of chink in Kennedy and Zekuchu's <laughs> and Zichiku's I just want to keep fucking saying it. Uh in Kennedy's game it's probably going to be the 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 jiu-jitsu. When we get physical specimens like these guys like Kennedy and Zichiku, they kind of just get away with their raw strength, uh their power in their hands, uh and they're able to intimidate these guys. Let's be real. To fucking have a cage or lock and look across the look across the octagon against a guy like Kennedy and Zichiku, you're just like fuck, right? That's what I would be thinking at least. That's coming from a 5'5 Indo-Canadian. <laughs> but with that said, <clears throat> with Paul Craig, you know, big guy. He's seen scarier guys in there, Tyson Pedro, Khalil Roundtree. Uh, so first of all, is he going to be able to endure uh, the striking or the power of Kennedy in Zichugu? Um And is he going to be able to get Kennedy down? I think he'll be able to get Kennedy down, and that's where I think this fight becomes very interesting. Uh, Kennedy, uh, yeah, Craig is roughly around plus 185. Kennedy is around minus 230 right now. I'd still say it's slightly wide. I was considering betting in Kennedy, uh, you know, when this fight was initially announced. But with the odds being as wide as they are, I'm kind of staying away from it. I want to see where they go throughout the week. I like Kennedy here. I think he is able to put Paul Craig out and, you know, shuck off the first takedown or two. And that would be enough for him to, like, eventually find that button on Paul Craig and put him out. Uh, but... There is that chance that if Paul Craig gets him down that first attempt, that he could probably just latch on a fucking uh, a choke or or a submission of some sort. You know, he he's always fishing for a submission, as we found out with that Magomed on Kalaev fight. So he might be able to pull off the 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 the, the upset here against Kennedy. But uh, I would really like to see Kennedy continue to progress. Uh, I think he could be a real problem in that two hundred five division if he progresses the correct way. So. This is a good test for him, even though a lot of people are just going to laugh at the fact that it's Paul Craig. Paul Craig is shitty as most people might think he is. He does have a chance to win fights with his jiu-jitsu as being uh, where it's at in a division where jiu-jitsu is not used that often, in my opinion, with light heavyweight. You know, once you get past middleweight, it's harder to find guys that are as well-versed in jiu-jitsu as the rest of the division is, uh, you know, but with the bigger guys, it's kind of overlooked. Because guys just try to get away with their strength and 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 power. So, I, I'm fuck. I'm gonna take Kennedy and Zuchuku by KO. But 
if Paul Craig hits me, like if Kennedy gets like crazy fucking love from betters and somehow Paul Craig gets up to like plus 250, I would consider a poke on Paul Craig. Just saying. But I'm going to take Kennedy and Zuchuku by first round KO. <laughs> Just absolutely steal um, his fucking soul. <laughs> All right. So next up, we got Michelle Watterson versus Karolina Kovalkovic. Probably one of the cuter fights that we'll see in the UFC. Starting off with Michelle Watterson, she's coming off of two straight wins, one off, one over Felice Herrig via unanimous decision, uh, and then before that, she beat Courtney Casey by split decision. Uh, she has losses to Rose Namajunas and Tisha Torres, which are very tough outs for her in her first like four UFC fights. Uh, but you know, she had a very successful run in, in Invicta, where she was the champion down there. It was weird; she got signed to the UFC after uh, losing via guillotine choke to Her- Herika Tibercio. Uh, she eventually got signed to the UFC and has like was given a fucking underhand throw with Angela Magana in her first fight. Uh, you know, with Michelle Watterson, they don't call her the karate hottie for no reason. She is a hottie and she has decent karate skills. Um, she's she you know she's good with staying light on her feet. She has decent movement. Uh, she has relatively um, impressive uh, a relatively impressive jujitsu game, but I'm not convinced that she has the the chops to get this fight to the ground uh with as much um you know tenaciousness as it would take to take down a girl like Karolina Kavakovic. unfortunately for michelle watterson you know the ufc does not have uh the atom weight division in in the ufc you know that is naturally her weight she needs to i don't think she cuts much weight to make uh 115 but realistically she be she should probably be at 105 um i don't think that this is a good fight for her. I think that Karolina Kovakovic has a good enough stand-up game to keep this fight on the feet. You know, uh, Michelle Watterson, 5'3", 62-inch uh, reach. Uh, whereas, again, I feel like fucking Karolina is taller than 5'3". 5'3", uh, 64 inches. So according to topology, there's only a 2-inch reach difference. But I think that, you know, Karolina Kovakovic has a very polished and disciplined stand-up game where she's going to be able to keep Michelle Watterson on the outside, you know, beat her up. Uh, you know, stick the jab in her face, uh, stay on her bike, um, be able to shuck off enough of it, n- enough takedowns to keep this on the feet and run away with a 30-27 decision. So I'm going to take uh, Karolina Kovakovic here. Uh, I want to look into it a little bit more because uh, I'm I, I'm still tinkering with the idea of playing Karolina Kovakovic. Um, but, uh, you know, I was just burned by a fucking straw weight fight this past weekend where I thought a girl had a clear edge but did not. Knowing my luck, I would bet Karolina Kovakovic and she'll come out here and fucking try to grapple Michelle Watterson and Watterson pulls off some sort of flying triangle bullshit. So I'm picking Carolina by a decision. Um, may consider it as a bet, uh, but I got, yeah, I got Carolina by a decision. <clears throat> Next up, we got the return of Josh Emmett versus Michael Johnson. Uh, so we're getting Josh Emmett back after he got KO'd brutally back in February of 2018 against Jeremy Stevens. Uh, somebody put out a list of all the fucking injuries that he had after that injury or after that knockout. One of the more fucking, like, gruesome through words. Like, just, like, normally people just think things are gruesome once they see something fucking gruesome. You know, it's in their face, a bloody body or some shit like that. But just reading <laughs> the fucking things that is wrong with the guy, uh, which were wrong with Josh Emmett after that loss to Jeremy Stevens, it's like, why would this guy even come back to fight? It's so much of a red flag, uh, especially coming back against a guy like Michael Johnson who has shown, you know, with precision striking, he can knock motherfuckers out. Just ask Dustin Poirier. Um, so there's a couple different uh, wrinkles to this matchup. So we got Josh Emmett's return, obviously, with everything that he's been through. Uh, we have Michael Johnson who missed weight in his last fight. Uh, say what you want about him taking it on short notice. Still missed weight. Uh, and if Michael Johnson is really even comfortable at 145, you know, he's had three fights on 145. Uh, he started off with that loss to Darren Elkins, but he's put together wins over Andre Feely and Artem Lobov. Since, um, I believe he has a striking advantage here against Josh Emmett. Josh Emmett has that, if you guys have been watching my podcast for a while now, I like to call it the wrestler hook, you know, where they just kind of blitz with the overhand right or overhand left. Uh, and they, that's what they kind of do to kind of close the distance. Usually they pack enough punch and power 
two drop guys and eventually, you know, uh, implement the, the, the grappling game. Uh, but I think that Josh Emmett has, you know, he has that same thing. But Michael Johnson's uh, striking uh, is to the extent where he will be able to, you know, pick apart guys who try to implement a striking game like that. So um, I'm going to take Michael Johnson by finish here. I think by second round KO, I think he puts Josh Emmett out. I think, you know, Josh Emmett probably should not be coming back. At least, you know, not more. He It's been less than a year just slightly less than a year less than a year more than a year it has been more than a year what the fuck am i doing uh it's been my, just a little bit more than a year but still, i think he, he needs to be off a little bit longer <coughs> fuck got something stuck in my throat regardless uh i'm gonna take michael johnson by second round ko here again better footwork better um striking Decent takedown defense. Just don't look at his Khabib and Magomedov fight. Um, and a very f- tough fight for Josh Emmett to come back to after such a brutal loss. So I'm going to take uh, Michael Johnson by second round KO. You know what? Fuck it. I'm going to call it first round. Michael Johnson first round KO. Uh, and I will look at a possible bet on that if uh, we see some dog money on our boy Michael Johnson. Which I think we might. Surprisingly. I think people are still like sold on the fact that Michael Johnson is not a true like a good 145er so they might put that into the equation but skill for skill I'm taking Michael Johnson and I'm taking Michael Johnson by first round KO <laughs> next up David Branch versus Jack Hermanson this is a fight that I'm really looking forward to um, starting off with David Branch he is coming off a loss to Jared Cannonier. he kind of just fucking bull rushed him in that second round uh, and finished him within 30 seconds. Uh, before that, David Branch pulled off of a surprising victory over Tiago Santos, where he finished him with strikes two and a half minutes into that first round, and then before that, got completely dummied and ragged all by Luke Rockhold, which is, in my opinion, a small possibility we could see a similar outcome from that fight in this fight against Jack Manson. So a lot of people are not familiar with Jack Manson, uh, at least if you're not, you know, an avid UFC watcher. But I think this is a fight that's going to kind of put him on the map. Uh, this is a fight, you know, against a ranked opponent, um, against a guy who's had some success in the octagon. And a lot of people know David. A lot of people know David Branch's name. But Jack Manson, you know, he's coming in here with a wacky striking style, uh, very good movement, um, you know. A lot of heart, you know, talk about that fight against Talos Latis where he popped his rib, uh, I believe, in the second round and still came back and won in the third. <clears throat> still finished Talos Latis in that third round. Um, and then a guy who is able to implement his grappling so much so to a level where he's able to pound guys out uh, and choke guys out uh, from a dominant position on top. So I think the style that he brings against David Branch is going to really fluster David Branch. I could see Jack Hermanson really having fun on the feet and then taking Brad uh, David Branch down and finishing this fight on the ground uh, via GNP. Uh, that's where I see that kind of Luke Rockhold fight coming into play. Uh, you know, we saw once Luke Rockhold was able to get David Branch down and get a dominant position, David Branch kind of just gave up. You know what I mean? Like, he was in a world of hurt, did not know how to get out. And that's very surprising for a guy with as much grappling credentials as David Branch, you know. Uh, that was a position that he could just not get out of uh, under Luke Rockhold and Jack Hermanson, in my opinion, kind of has a similar, you know, size and like he's six one, so six one seventy five inch reach. Luke Rockhold is six three seventy seven inch reach. So obviously Luke Rockhold is just a freak of nature when it comes to reach. But Jack Hermanson is a very tall and big guy for this one eighty five division, and I think he's just hitting his peak. You know, he's thirty years old. He's coming off of two victories over Talos Latis and Jill Mearshart. Uh, you know, his only setback to Tiago Santos uh, back in 2017 and before that was a, an arm triangle choke to Cesar Ferreira back in his second fight in the UFC. But, you know, he has runs over Scott Askham, Alex Nicholson, Brad Scott, Talos Latis, Gerald Mirscher, and this fight against David Branch will be the first time he has a legitimate name on his record. And I think he is definitely going to achieve that. So my only concern here in this fight with Jack Hermanson is if they do get onto the ground uh, and Jack Hermanson, you know, maybe overextends a little bit on his ground and pound and David Branch is able to find an opening for a sweep or a, a reversal of some sort and he's able to implement his own type of grappling. With that said, I'm very, 
I, I like Jack Hermanson's game in terms of getting up. You know, I, I'm very impressed with how he's able to get up. Uh, he, he has a decent jiu-jitsu game of his own, but he does most of his work and most of his damage from the top position and the uh, dominant position. So I think he's able. To, he's going to be able to find that those positions against David Branch here and pound him out. I'm really liking the the fight doesn't go to decision at minus 180-ish right now. It's something that I'm considering as a lock play. But Jack Manson is somebody that I'm considering for a big play as well. So I see a lot of spots on this card, and Jack Manson is one of my stronger leans here. Uh, very impressed with him. We might even see plus money on him too because a lot of people might be thinking, oh, David Branch, that's a name. I don't know who the fuck Jack Manson is. And more often than not, you're going to get a lot of betters that just fucking throw money blindly like that. And here... I think it's going to bite him in the ass, and we're going to get a Jack Hermanson victory. I'm going to say by a second, third round, second round TKO. Going to be a great fight for uh, Jack Hermanson. I can't wait for the Joker to finally get the recognition he deserves. Next up, Edson Barboza versus Justin Gaethje. Nope, there's no horns happening this time. The funny thing is. So somebody brought it up on the comment section in the last one was uh, the the horns were scaring their cat. <laughs> you know, as I started like watching it back and like started watching my intros into these main events and, and listening to the, the horns, eh, I think it lost its kind of, it lost its touch after the first couple. So I'm abandoning that, the horn skill for all your ears, for all the goodness of your ear <laughs> and the health of your ears. <clears throat> So we're just going to get right the fuck into it. Maybe I'll just tell you guys how many horns out of three I would give it rather than making you guys listen to them. <laughs> but I'm fucking excited for this. All the horns for this one. Every single one. One, two, three, four, five. However many horns there are, fucking blow them for this fight. Edson Barboza versus Justin Gaethje. Going to be a fucking banger. Uh, this is the fight for all the shit-eating wild men out there. This is the fight for all the casuals out there. This is the fight that I would get my man fucking Big Rob to watch as well. Uh, so with Ed, Edson Barboza, let's talk about the fact that he completely butchered and dismantled Daniel Hooker in that last fight. Absolutely ridiculous fight. Uh, went down in December of this past month or this past year. Uh, before that, he took two absolute beatings by uh, Kevin Lee and Habib Nurmagomedov. I was uh, surprised to see Edson Barboza back so quickly. I, I'm going to call it quickly, eight months after the Kevin Lee loss. You know, he took a lot of damage in that fight. And then four or five months before that, he took a lot of damage from Khabib Nurmagomedov. But his chin held up good against Daniel Hooker. And he was able to get a, a beautiful, a masterful finish over Daniel Hooker in the third round of that fight. Uh, and now he's coming up against the king of violence and Justin Gaethje. So any progression that he may have may have made with, uh, you know, the, the, the healing and recovery of his chin, it's going all out the motherfucking window against, this, uh, against Justin Gaethje here. You know, Justin Gaethje coming off of uh, a, an upset victory over James Vick in his last fight where he made my man James Vick turn into an inflatable two-man. Um, you know, knocked him out a minute and a half into that first round uh, and kind of shut up a lot of the guys that were saying that James Vick was going to completely steamroll him. Uh, you know, Justin Gaethje also was coming off of two losses before his last victory. He had lost to Eddie Alvarez and uh, lost to Dustin Poirier, who is now fighting for an interim lightweight title. A lightweight title? I don't know. What a, whatever the fuck is going on there. Uh, and before that, you know, he beat Michael Johnson in his UFC debut. Fucking uh, fight of the year right there as well. So in this fight against Justin uh, or Edson Barboza, you know, we know Edson Barboza game. He wants to keep it on the feet, uh, you know. It's going to be interesting to see who wins the leg kick game here because Edson Barboza, you know, stylistically and technically, he's the better and one of the best leg kickers we've ever seen in the UFC. Justin Gaethje doesn't really give a fuck too much about the technique. You know, he does have these loud, chopping fucking leg kicks and able to even like leg kicks from the clinch position, which is fucking ridiculous. You know, when do you ever see somebody fucking pull that shit? It's crazy. Um, you know, uh, he may not throw it with the precision, precision and technique of an Edson Barboza, but it has shown in his past fight that it does make a difference. It's a fucking game changer. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Edson Barboza takes those leg kicks if he's able to check them and uh, you know, if he's able to withstand them and implement his own at the same time. Justin Gaethje has the perfect route to a victory here if you wanted to play it the way he probably should if he wants to secure victories in his career. And that's implementing his uh, wrestling. 
He has very strong wrestling, but it, it's so sad that we never get to see it that much because this motherfucker just likes to bang. There's a reason his nickname is the Highlight. You know what I mean? This motherfucker just loves to bang. And the fact that he has such a pedigree and resume with the wrestling aspect of his game, it's a shame that we never get to see it in the UFC because, you know, he could use it to the point where he's just fainting and, and getting these guys to bite on these these, these feints uh, of a takedown and just fucking come back with an uppercut or come back with a different sort of strike to kind of throw these guys off. It's just more, you know, ammo for him to be able to keep these guys on their toes uh, with these different techniques and different uh, ways of entering and closing the distance. But it's just so hard to know if we're going to see that from Justin Gaethje. You know, we don't know if this is going to be the fight where he goes, you know what, fuck it. Let's try to get to a title shot. Let's try to secure a, a victory here. Am I really going to try to bang it out against a guy like Edson Barboza? And don't get me wrong, we've seen in the past where Edson Barboza has been lit up guy, by guys that aren't primarily strikers. Cough, cough, Benil Darius. You know, he was getting lit up in that fight. And Benil Darius isn't the strongest striker. You know, we saw him get dropped a couple times by Drew, Drew Dober a couple weeks ago. But, you know, all Edson Barboza needed was that one shot. You know, that flying knee, crazy flying knee that landed right on the button button of Benio Darius and put him out. Uh, but is he going to do that with Justin Gaethje here? Is Gaethje's chin completely gone? Is Gaethje going to be able to eat one of those clean head kicks from Edson Barboza? Is he going to be able to eat a flying knee? You know, I don't know. <laughs> the only thing I feel comfortable betting in this fight is the, the fight doesn't go to decision at. And it currently sitting at minus 500. I wouldn't bet that. That's just too wide for me. You know, that's that's too much. I, I don't know what to play here. Um, I like Edson Barboza. You know, I think he's... I think he should be favored, which is what he is right now, minus four, 140-ish to plus 110-ish to Justin Gaethje. But knowing the chaos that's going to come out of this fight and the fact that a Justin Gaethje fight is never going to be that easy to predict, I would stay away from it. You know, I don't want to be a complete degenerate and try to pick a side here. I would pick Edson, but I am picking Edson Barboza to win by third round KO. Uh, that's one thing you got to give Edson Barboza as well is that even through all the beatings that he's taken, he's never quit. You know, that Kevin Lee fight got stopped due to a cut, but that guy was taking that beating like a man and just fucking trudging through it. So I don't think him seeing Justin Gaethje walk through these shots and kind of just zombify his ass, I don't think that's going to demoralize Edson Barboza. I think he's seen worse in there. Well, nobody's seen as a, a madman like Justin Gaethje, but I think that Edson Barboza is mentally strong enough to withstand the fact that Justin Gaethje is probably going to eat some of his biggest shots and still be walking forward. And I think that's how Edson Barboza is still going to win this fight in the third round where he, you know, I think he puts Justin's lights out uh, with some sort of spectacular knockout. Um, but a part of me is kind of praying that we see Justin Gaethje kind of take a more measured approach, implement his grappling, his clinching, get this fight to the ground, see if he can make do some work from there, uh, and then maybe just fucking go balls to the wall in the second, third, or fourth round. Just give us a glimpse of how good Jeremy May wrestling is. That's all I want. Give us a glimpse of it. Let us know how it looks. Um, but in the end, I'm going to say Edson Barboza by thir third round uh, TKO. All right, that's a fucking wrap, guys. That was UFC Philadelphia, top to bottom, bottom to top, whatever the fuck you want to call it. I deserve some horns for that. Shit. I'm sorry, I had to fucking do it. I feel like shit. It's, it already feels like it's been a long week. It's fucking Tuesday. Feels like it's been a long week, but I teased on Twitter that I finally gave my two weeks to my part-time job. I'm gonna have so much more time to commit to this shit, to commit to making myself better as a better. Um, and as somebody who, that provides content to you guys as well, you know, one part of my game is 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 MMA handicapping, and another part of my game is you know giving you guys content content like this, like the Combat Assures, and like all the shit that I'm about to drop very soon for you guys. But you know, I I, I want to grow both things as best as I can, and I think that with the extra five-ish hours that I'm going to be getting a day uh, to dedicate to this stuff is uh, I'm just going to be you know progressing leaps and bounds, and I can't wait. And I'm, I'm just excited to have you guys along for the journey. All the supporters, all the subscribers, all the retweets, tweets, all the all the love. I fucking love it. I very much appreciate you guys. And again, I got to give a big, th big shout out to my man, Big Rob. Because without him, I don't know if this would even be possible. Let's just be real. It's just everything up in here that's that I'm bringing, but he's bringing everything else and making it as uh, as good as possible. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it for this week's episode. Uh, we are off next week. 
um, at least with the MMA Lockcast. We're going to be recording episode two of the Combat of Sewers next week. Uh, so me and Tony are going to be in the studio. Um, you guys can expect that at the end of the week-ish uh, of next week. But I also got something cool dropping for you guys in the next day or two. Uh, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, super excited, man. I'm, I'm fucking stoked. Let's fucking get this money. I, I'm just looking forward to actually getting a winning weekend this weekend. Getting a winning event this weekend. Because... I fucking need it. I fucking fucking need it. So, um, good luck to everybody. You know, hit me in the comment section below. Like, subscribe, do all that shit. Um, I'm always. You guys can see from the past videos. I always uh, like to have conversations with my 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 viewers and all that stuff. So, if you have any questions, any other things that you want to talk about, just fucking hit me in the comment section below for YouTube. Uh, if you guys are listening to the audio version of this, as you guys know, you guys can get this on podcast podcast <laughs> in podcast form, audio form on iTunes, Stitcher. Um, SoundCloud and one more that I feel like I'm missing right now but I can't just think of off the top of my head Spotify Spotify there we go um, and yeah I appreciate you guys listening as always um, and hit me on Twitter that's the hub for me if you ever want anything to do with me know anything about me know what the fuck is going on or even ask me a question Twitter is the spot at M-M-A-L-O-T-N it's on the fucking hat <laughs> at M-M-A-L-O-T-N uh, hit me up on there. Like, follow me on there. Do whatever the fuck you want to me on there. DM me. It's cool. All right. That's it. UFC Philadelphia and the Raps. Good luck to everybody this weekend. See you guys next week for Combat of Sewers. And then the following week, we're going to be breaking down the pay-per-view, I believe. UFC 236. UFC 236 Holloway versus Poirier 2. That's it. I'm out. We're done. Peace. Later. Later.